Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to CSIS. My name is Arno de Borgrave. I direct the Transnational Threats Project at CSIS. I guess my reason for being here today is that I've spent a lot of time in my journalistic career in South Asia. First covered the Chinese invasion of India in 1962, covered two of the three wars that India and Pakistan have fought. Um, I've also covered the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, and just before 9-11, I was in Afghanistan covering the Taliban regime. So think tanks, as you know, I'm sure better than I do, uh, are by definition designed to open things up for deeper discussion about the critical issues of our time. And that's what we endeavored to do with, the, uh, with argue, what is arguably the most important foreign policy challenge facing President Obama and his national security team. It's part Pakistan, part Afghanistan, and of course, part Fatah. As Pakistan's ambassador to the United States, Hussein Haqqani, himself put it to the House Armed Services Committee, Pakistan continues to be a major center for Islamist militancy, radical Islamists who came from all over the Muslim world to fight against the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan, with powerful encouragement, of course, from the U.S. and Saudi Arabia throughout the 1980s. These same Islamists and their sons went on to become allies of Pakistan's military intelligence apparatus. Ambassador Haqqani added these Islamists were then used to fight Indian control over Kashmir, as well as to expand Pakistan's influence in Afghanistan. What we call extremists, and what Pakistani intelligence sometimes regards as assets, is part of the problem as the team assembled by CSIS takes a new and different look with granularity at the critical issue of Fatah, those seven tribal agencies under Pakistani sovereignty, which Pakistan has always had a hard time exercising, and which the Mumbai terrorist massacre makes even more critical. Now that India has turned over the evidence that the Mumbai terrorists were Pakistanis trained in Pakistan, Islamabad says it will bring those responsible to justice. But for those of you who follow that part of the world more closely, you know that if things blew up again today. The National Security Advisor of Pakistan, Ambassador Durrani, was uh, pushed out of office. Um, also, uh, Pakistan rejects the latest allegation from the Indian government that it was Pakistan at the government level that did Mumbai and so on and so forth, but it seems to have gained traction again as a crisis. Frequently overlooked by all sides is the impact of madrasas, the thousands of single disciplined Quranic schools that produce plenty of potential volunteers for extremist actions, including suicide missions, but we forget that the CIA and Saudi intelligence encourage the notion of jihad training to mobilize resistance against the Red Army in Afghanistan. And at the outset, madrasas were established as an ideological barrier against the spread of communism from Afghanistan into Pakistan. And secret Saudi Wahhabi clergy funds continue to keep the madrasa culture alive to this very day. The future of Afghanistan, the future of NATO, the future or failure of President Obama's foreign policy, all are at stake in the acronym FATA. General David Petraeus told me last summer a fresh look at FATA was high on his list of priorities. Hence this CSIS initiative, and I gave the new CENTCOM commander the very first unedited, unbound copy without, of course, the charts and graphs and maps over a month ago. This effort of ours was uh, encouraged and funded by the Smith Richardson Foundation. The U.S. and NATO forces in Afghanistan receive 70% of their supplies, including food and 40% of their fuel, overland from the port of Karachi, a thousand kilometer journey through the Khyber Pass, uh, now the world's most vulnerable lifeline. Subject, as you know, to frequent hit and run attacks by pro Taliban raiders. There is little doubt in the intelligence community that Al Qaeda is plotting the next 9 11 somewhere in Fatah. Turkey, Germany, and the UK, just to name three countries, have tracked local national terrorist suspects to Fatah and back, presumably for training. This, of course, is not to say that Pakistan hasn't been a victim of terrorism. In fact, it has been one of its principal victims in the world and taken many casualties fighting it. Heading our CSIS task force on Fatah and the principal author of the report that you have today is Shusha Nawaz, a US-based Pakistani scholar who recently published an international bestseller titled Cross Swords, Pakistan, Its Army, and the Wars Within, which you can get through Amazon, Oxford, Uni Oxford University Press. Shusha is also a journalist who has reported for print and web and TV media, media and is much in demand as a speaker about Pakistan and the region on U.S. and Pakistani broadcast media and, of course, at think tanks on both sides of the Atlantic. 
Truja also had 30 years of experience as an international civil servant at the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, and he was also a director at IAEA in Vienna. Next Monday, he becomes, and this is an exclusive uh, announcement, he becomes the first director of the South Asian Center at the Atlantic Council here in Washington. Also on this panel this afternoon is Azi Hussein, Dr. Hussein, who was one of the five specialists who worked with Shuja on this effort. He's vice president for preventive diplomacy at the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy, acronym ICRD, here in Washington. Dr. Hussein currently heads ICRD's Pakistan Madrasa Project, which has trained more than 2,000 Madrasa leaders in a campaign to take these out of control, out of the control of extremist mullahs, who teach, of course, as you know, that the United States is on a crusade to destroy Islam, and that 9-11 was a plot by the CIA and Mossad to provide, to provide the pretext to do just that. Dr. Hussein was the recipient of the 2006 Peacemakers in Action Award by the Tannenbaum Center, for Interreligious Understanding in New York. You will see in your report pages 36 through 41 deal with what can be done near term, which means the next year or two, and medium term, or three to five years, by the government of Pakistan, the Pakistan military, the US, US military, CENTCOM, and the government of Afghanistan. The costs of failure are simply put a victory for transnational terrorism and mission impossible in Afghanistan. As the report concludes, a nuclear Pakistan as a base for international terrorism is a prospect that the world cannot afford. But there are no quick solutions. Without the short-term action recommendations, the mid-term ones, let alone the long-term ones, become pie in the sky. So now I turn it over to Shuja. Thank you. Thank you, Arno. I'm honored to present uh, a very brief look at this fairly detailed report, um, which, as Arno uh, has explained to you, was a joint effort of uh, a number of uh, persons um, who contributed to it over a very short period. Um, just to give you an idea, we, we began the project uh, in July this year, uh, last year, and uh, with a lot of intensive meetings here, uh, often uh, meetings with people in different parts of the world, communicating by uh, audio conference, uh, we managed to get the project going, uh, produce uh, some initial hypotheses and recommendations, and then uh, with support from the CSIS, um, uh, managed to go into the field and try and test some of those ideas by talking to key people uh, in government uh, as well as uh, others in FATA. Uh, so this is a joint effort, um, although it carries my name as the principal author, um, I, I should acknowledge the contributions of the, the other participants. And um, although you have the, uh, the, the monograph with you, uh, just briefly, uh, they included Mariam Abu Zahab, who is a scholar and uh, who has spent 35 years uh, as an expert on Fata. Uh, she even speaks some Pashto, and she spends all her free time when she's not teaching at Sciences Po or any other place in Paris. Uh, she gets on the plane, leaves all her Western clothes behind, um, and dresses uh, in the local garb, gets on the plane, and arrives there. Uh, and indeed, um, she spent a few months there recently. Um, Azi Hussain has already been introduced. He was an extremely valuable resource because here is another person who's been in the field uh, working within Afghanistan as well as in Fata and in madrasas in Karachi, among other places, uh, where he's trying uh, to, to roll this uh, huge rock uh, up the hill, uh, the rock of militancy. Um, and then Aisha Jalal, uh, who uh, many of you probably know from her previous writings. Uh, she's a brilliant historian now at Tufts University. Uh, and her most recent book is Partisans of Allah, uh, which is the story of jihad. Um, and Aisha um, participated in this venture 
uh, as an expert in the sense that she uh, kept us on the straight and narrow. Uh, she uh, would listen in on our discussions and, and ask all the tough questions. Uh, and then she would comment on the drafts. And then Kim Martin, uh, who is from Barnard College, who's done a lot of work on conflict resolution and post-conflict situations, uh, and who has recently developed an interest in Fatah, and so um, immediately immersed herself in such deep research that we felt that she was an extremely valuable member of the team. Uh, and then uh, the youngest member of the team, a brilliant uh, PhD candidate uh, uh, from uh, SAIS, Johns Hopkins University, Josh White, Unfortunately, he couldn't be here either today. I would have wanted him to come and present uh, some of his ideas, uh, but a lot of his research and thinking is reflected in the report. And I want to thank all these team members for their efforts because the report is, uh, as I said, a joint effort. Um, just very briefly, uh, it was interesting for me to, to concentrate on this, not just as a Pakistani, but uh, as, as somebody who's been following developments in Fatah for the last few years uh, with, with a lot of dismay and uh, unhappiness at what was happening uh, because to me it appeared that history appeared to be repeating itself and that uh, what successive governments uh, going back uh, 100 uh, plus years have been doing in Fatah, uh, we risk repeating unless we look to a new way of involving the people of Fatah and make, making them the primary source of information and guidance before we go in uh, with our avowed mission of, of developing them and, and moving them away from uh, whatever path we think that they are taking. Um, I discovered, for instance, uh, just in the last few weeks that my own grandfather, who had uh, served in the British Indian Army, uh, had fought in two Waziristan campaigns. He fought in 1901 and in 1908, and he was wounded in 1908. He ended up then fighting uh, in a place called Mesopotamia, which many of us now know as Iraq. Um, and he was wounded in Iraq too. And then for his sins, I guess, he was sent to Belgium, uh, and he fought there. So there's, there's a kind of a family connection, uh, because his son, my uncle, then fought in, in 1937 uh, again, a Waziristan campaign and was mentioned in dispatches. So these wars and these punitive expeditions are going to carry on unless we want to change the course of history. And, and this is why we felt it was important to look at Fatah and to come up with what we thought were practicable solutions, uh, things that could be done that weren't 60,000 feet, uh, that were at ground level, that with the right amount of political will uh, that uh, some things could get started. As Arno said, our recommendations, which are short-term, could only work um, and, and lay the, the basis for the medium-term recommendations. But most important, we believe that unless you restore security to the region, and unless you provide that security from inside the region rather than from fortresses and from camps uh, that are kept apart from the people of Fatah, uh, that you are not going to be able to gain that traction uh, and get them uh, involved and, and get the ownership that you require uh, for any project to work in Fatah. Um, as we mentioned in the report, and I will, I will go through this uh, later uh, in my introduction, uh, there are examples of things that work. Uh, even uh, you know, the much maligned U.S. aid effort uh, has some very bright spots in it, uh, the Office of Transition Initiatives, has tested certain techniques for, for getting things done. Uh, the uh, NAS, which is the Narcotics Assistance Section of the U.S. Embassy, has long experience in the area. Uh, and one of their lessons has also been that if you work with the people and they help you identify what their needs are, then you can give them the ownership and they'll help you succeed. So why is Fatah so critical now? Uh, as Arno was uh, saying in his introduction, it's critical because it's not simply a sliver of land on, on, on the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan, but it's uh, an issue that confronts the world, and it's an issue that confronts Afghanistan and Pakistan together. So you cannot look at it solely in terms of a Pakistani perspective and then cross the border and take an Afghan perspective. 
because that border is porous and has always been. Uh, we found an old map that we put in the report. We've sort of dolled it up a little bit so that it's more readable. Uh, and even though that map is incomplete in some ways because some of the tribes that we now know exist uh, in each of the, the agencies are not mentioned there, like the Salarzai of Bajor, uh, that map gives you an idea of, of just how discrete and self-contained these tribal and sub-tribal units are. And that's a very important element of dealing with Fatah, that uh, you cannot find a silver bullet, you can't find a single solution that will uh, allow you to find an answer to all the problems uh, that we face in that region or emanating from that region. We're also looking at Fatah because um, the United States uh, is concerned that uh, the, the sort of petri dish for uh, global terrorism resides in that area or on the outskirts of that area. And it's been very hard to pinpoint exactly where uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Al-Qaeda people and Osama bin Laden uh, are actually residing, but uh, in all probability, uh, they find the border equally porous and they probably may, are moving uh, at will. And if you were to ask me, I would think that it's probably in the northern reaches that you might find them. But to go back to th the basic point that we discovered in looking at past experience and what's happening now in Fatah, and that point I, I cannot stress and repeat enough, which is that you have to go to the people, find out what their needs are, and then try and get them involved in meeting those needs. That highfalutin programs and projects that are conceived in distant Washington or the capitals of Europe uh, or in Tokyo will not do the trick. Uh, you really have to get them involved. Just a very brief history. Uh, many of you uh, I know from the list that I've seen uh, already expert in the region. But uh, one of the problems uh, that has occurred uh, in creating uh, the, the conflict in Fatah is that it has always historically been treated as a buffer zone. So it didn't have an entity of its own. The British began this uh, policy uh, and they insisted that there be a demarcation of the boundary and so Sir Mortimer Durand went ahead and, and drew lines on the map and when you see the map that we have of the, the ancient tribal boundaries, you'll find that he ended up uh, dissecting some of the major tribal groups. For instance, the Momands, who are a very major tribal uh, group in Pakistan, um, are divided by the Durand line between Afghanistan and Pakistan. And as a result, they have never accepted the boundary. Uh, and Afghanistan did not actually allow the physical uh, demarcation of that uh, segment of the boundary. The other thing was that uh, Fata uh, when it was inherited by Pakistan in 1947, um, instead of amalgamating it or over time amalgamating it into the rest of Pakistan, uh, it became a separate entity. It had its own legal system, which was the Frontier Crimes Regulations, uh, which go back to the beginning of the 20th century. As a result, there, there was no sense of belonging and no sense of participation in the polity of Pakistan by the people that lived in Fatah. It's amazing that in spite of that, the people of Fatah continued to interact with Pakistan as if it was their own country. And in fact, um, as a very brief mention of some recruiting statistics into the Pakistan army show, there's been an actual increase in the number of people uh, who are being recruited for both soldiers and officer ranks uh, in Fatah and who are then retiring and going back to the father. The other big uh, problem uh, was that from the get-go, the political participation of people of Fata was taken away from them. They could only look after their own affairs inside Fata. Uh, the Political Parties Act of Pakistan did not apply. So as a result, when you go there, you see the flags of various Pakistani political parties flying, but none of their officials, none of their leaders are allowed to go to Fatah and campaign or to run candidates on their uh, tickets. So over time, uh, when uh, following General Ziaul Haq's uh, regime, uh, when the mullah became, came to the forefront, uh, you basically had an open uh, space which the mullah then occupied and he had a pulpit and that became his political uh, base. 
And no wonder that uh, today uh, religion is such an important part of the polity of Fatah. So uh, this is another issue that obviously needs to be tackled. Um, another point that's worth uh, remembering is that uh, there was at, at some point uh, an attempt made to settle uh, Shia groups in what's now the Kurram Agency. And so you have in a small part of Fatah a very active proxy war that has been going on for many years. Uh, and in this, the, the participation of both the Iranian and Saudi backers has often been mentioned. Uh, and what makes it really dangerous now is that the extreme right-wing Punjabi militant groups, some of whom are now being implicated in the Mumbai attacks, have actually moved into that area and are providing muscle for the, the rest of the, the uh, Sunni groups there against the Shia. And so you've had an exodus of the Shia into Afghanistan, for instance. Uh, this is an extremely dangerous move because uh, the people that have come are those that at one time were obviously being trained for the, the jihad in Kashmir, and so they are extremely sophisticated in their training. They can, they can teach people on how to make bombs and, and use uh, advanced uh, weapon systems. So against this background, and in, in the wake of the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan, uh, we thought that it would be important to lay out uh, very briefly some of the perceptions and realities that are confronted uh, when we look at Fatah. And uh, it's worth talking about these because it's sometimes very difficult to separate perceptions from reality. And quite often, the perception ends up reinforcing reality. And so, uh, therefore, these are, uh, I'll just go through these because they give a summary of, of the views of, of the team. First, the U.S. went into Afghanistan without a comprehensive plan for winning the war beyond the immediate ouster of the Taliban. And, and the evidence for this is the fairly rapid shift of the United States forces from Afghanistan to Iraq. There was, at that time, no evidence of a comprehensive socioeconomic development plan or what would be a definition of victory in Afghanistan. The United States also failed to see the proactive need to help Pakistan transform its own army uh, and the Frontier Corps into an effective counterinsurgency force. And this was done almost blindly by agreeing to a transfer of resources through the coalition support funds uh, so that there was a bill and a reimbursement and there was almost no discussion at the beginning of what the objectives were, what the benchmarks would be, and how would that be tested over time. And so as a result, uh, the Pakistan army has been in a kind of reactive mode ever since. Another perception or reality is that Afghanistan did not show a willingness to address the grievances of the Taliban against the excesses of the Northern Alliance in the wake of the U.S. invasion. Now this has fed a very strong perception that persists to this day that somehow uh, the U.S. move is an anti-Pashtun move or an anti-Pakhtun move uh, and therefore uh, till Afghanistan internally resolves this matter, uh, this problem is likely to persist. Another powerful reality is this. The United States cannot win the war in Afghanistan without the full and willing participation and support of Pakistan, its army, as well as its general population. And unfortunately, as time goes by, the popular support uh, in Pakistan for this war, which was seen as America's war, has been dwindling. Also, the United States cannot win by aligning itself with any single individual or party in Pakistan. And this was evident in the reliance on President and General Parvez Musharraf, uh, who was all in all uh, after 2001. Arno has already uh, referred to another reality, which is that some 80% of cargo and 40% of the fuel uh, that is consumed in Afghanistan by the coalition uh, is supplied 
through Pakistan in these shipments that come from Karachi and then go across the border in Chaman at, uh, in Balochistan as, as well as in Torkhan. The reality also is that Uzbekistan has expelled the United States and, and Russia has the ability to block flights uh, over its territory. So the alternatives are very uh, insignificant. There are reports of a road that has now been constructed uh, with help from the Indian Frontier Works Organization or the Border uh, Works Organization. And uh, that road goes through Iran uh, to Chabahar. But then uh, we face another uh, immovable object, which is Iran, in terms of US foreign policy. Another perception or reality, call, call it what you will, is that uh, Pakistan, its army, and the ISI have had a very ambivalent position regarding the Afghan Taliban. And this was based on a very strong uh, uh, supposition that the United States would exit Afghanistan rapidly, as it once did after the exit of the Soviets from Afghanistan. Uh, and that this could also happen if they captured or killed some of the Taliban leadership and that the US would declare victory and move on. And the other supposition was that uh, Pakistan wanted some kind of a friendly or at least neutral government uh, in Kabul, uh, even if it was the Taliban. Uh, and because uh, the Taliban are Pakhtun, uh, and because most of uh, Fatah is, is entirely, uh, all of Fatah is Pakhtun. Uh, it was seen as uh, a win-win situation for Pakistan if uh, there was another Pakhtun government in Kabul. On its part, Afghanistan has some perceptions that, it, uh, uh, that informs its actions. And one of them is uh, a fear that Pakistan wants to maintain control over Afghanistan as some kind of a client state. The fact that it is a landlocked economy uh, makes it harder for Afghanistan uh, to be independent of Pakistan in that regard. And another powerful and persistent perception within Pakistan, which informs the situation in Fatah, is that rival India has chosen to develop both civil and military ties um, with Afghanistan. And uh, it is alleged that it even helps fuel some of the militancy in Pakistan. So many Pakistanis, when you talk to people on the street, still see uh, some kind of a massive international conspiracy to encircle and weaken and destroy Pakistan. And uh, many of them repeatedly point to this uh, famous map that uh, Mr. Peters produced about the new Middle East with bits of Pakistan floating off into other neighboring countries. Yet we have to recognize that neither capitulation no confrontation by Pakistan uh, with US interests in Afghanistan and in Fatah is the right approach. Uh, rather, engagement and a joint effort to eliminate the militancies inside Afghanistan and Pakistan is the best approach. And how to, how to go about it? Uh, Pakistan has committed the equivalent of six divisions uh, to Fatah and to a Northwest Frontier Province against the militancy. Uh, these are the six divisions that formed part of Pakistan's strike force against India if ever there was to be a conflict. And so the Pakistan army is very nervous about this very vulnerable area where they've now removed the infantry from the Indian border and the infantry is sitting on the Afghan border. But the reality is also that the Pakistan army is predominantly as uh, the share of population of the various provinces indicates 60% a Punjabi army. And so there are only something like 14.6% Pakhtuns in the Pakistan army. And so when they go into Fatah, uh, and they go especially outside the built up areas where some people do speak Urdu, they are totally an alien force. And that's how they're also regarded by the people in the countryside. So it's a very difficult kind of situation. The reality also is that Pakistan is fighting a counterinsurgency and a militancy inside its own borders. So it has to be very cognizant of the damage, uh, collateral damage, particularly to civilians, uh, which will have a huge uh, backlash, not just in Fatah, but in the rest of the country. 
Another reality which has emerged over the last few years is that the traditional system of governance that was used in Fatah, that was inherited from the British, uh, involved a government representative, a political agent, who was supposed to know all the tribal leaders and who would selectively appoint maliks, uh, uh, who would then receive largesse from the government and uh, deal with them. And then they were responsible for uh, keeping law and order uh, within their areas. Uh, but the, the, the sad thing of this system of government was that there was tribal responsibility for any wrongdoing. So if I belonged to the Dawar tribe in North Waziristan and something happened in my area and I was the head malik, I would be called in and thrown into jail and my family would be thrown into jail and I would be told to go and produce the crooks and, because the whole tribe is responsible and all our privileges and all our, our payments would be stopped. So this is a very crude uh, colonial system that was inherited by Pakistan and maintained by it. Well, over time, with the change in demographics, uh, the porosity of the border, the movement of the Pakhtun population from Fatah to other parts of Pakistan, particularly to Karachi and the Gulf, uh, you had an opening of the minds of people in Fatah. And so uh, this old system no longer works. Uh, what made it even uh, less um, effective was that we had uh, a number of successive governors of the Northwest Frontier Province under General Musharraf, who were ex-army people, who, who, even though they were Pakhtuns themselves, uh, decided that the old system of beating the Pakhtuns over their heads till they begged for forgiveness and then giving them money was the best way of ruling them. And so when they went in, um, after the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan and tried to help clear the, the border, uh, they ended up uh, alienating the, uh, the Maliks, they ended up alienating and, uh, the political administrators. And when these power centers disappeared, uh, guess who was around to pick up the pieces and take charge? It was the Mullah again. I won't go into uh, great detail about the role and the emergence of the mullah because I mentioned it a few times and, and you will see in the uh, report itself how over time there was a, a, a sociological transformation of tribal society and how the mullah who used to be a peripheral actor came into the center of the tribal decision making. Um, so I, I'm going to skip over that. Uh, We've also heard repeatedly uh, from the, the many excellent other reports that have been done on Fatah and on Pakistan recently by think tanks uh, in Washington uh, of the disparity in the socioeconomic indicators. So suffice it to say that uh, when you have female literacy of 3% in Fatah and if uh, the socioeconomic indicators in Pakistan are here, in the Northwest Frontier Province they're here, and in Fatah they're over here, um, there is a, a massive disequilibrium in opportunity for those people and uh, why would they feel part of Pakistan and, and feel in ownership for Pakistan? Before I go um, into a very brief uh, introduction of some of the key suggestions that we made, I think at this point uh, I would like to ask Azi if he could talk a little bit about uh, the work that he has done and that he contributed uh, to our effort on uh, the madrasa reform, because that's an issue that is uh, quite critical to how we proceed on Fatah. So, Azi. Can you all hear me? Um, I know after, after lunch there is a food coma happening here, so. I'll try to make it exciting. Um, uh, madrasas are probably, most of you all know, uh, are religious institutions. Uh, they provide uh, room and board, boarding for uh, and food for uh, students, uh, largely poor students in Pakistan. And uh, it's an eight-year program. It's called Dars and Izami curriculum. <coughs> um, emphasis is on religious uh, teaching. Um, uh, the first part of it is uh, hifs, which is memorization of Quran. And after that, they can learn about uh, the 
the Prophet's life, the, the philosophy of Islam, and uh, uh, most of these madrasas are there is there are about uh, there are about uh, nobody knows how many, but about twenty to twenty-five thousand of these uh, seminaries that are full-time uh, in Pakistan. Some of them are very big. Almost like a university setup, um, have uh, up to seven to eight thousand students that live there. Uh, so it's a, it's a pretty big enterprise. Um, um, madrasas are also important because uh, they create imams or clerics for Pakistani society. And um, as you can imagine, you can create an engineer or a doctor. But when you have an imam who speaks to a few thousand people every week, uh, advises a lot of people, uh, the reach and influence of the message of a cleric is huge. So madrasas, uh, though might be uh, small and compared to the numbers of public school system that have, in fact, more of an uh, impact in a Pakistani society, uh, if, you, if, you start to n if you multiply the influence of each uh, uh, cleric who is getting out of these schools. Uh, again, I think um, Shuja already talked about perceptions, and I think perceptions are real in their consequences because uh, most of it is perception on both sides as well, in America as well, and in and, and West. And uh, when, when a madrasa, especially religious leaders, perceive that the United States is out there to uh, destroy the identity of Islam, and they are there to uh, protect the identity of Islam, of course, you are fighting a intractable battle. And uh, it is intractable in, 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 in such a acute way that uh, unless these issues are resolved and some of the tones are not uh, changed, I think those perceptions will persist. Um, <clears throat> just to give you, just to wake you up a little bit more, I think uh, especially when I'm talking to Tariq Taliban uh, commander in Northwest Frontier Province, especially in Fatah area, uh, uh, he says, thank God, uh, you know, you really shown your colors. And you mean Americans, he thinks of me as an American. He's th gone through our workshop, and he said, we had such a hard time for the last two, three years recruiting people to fight the Westerners. And as soon as the predator strike in a madrasa in Northwest Frontier, Fatah area, we have hundreds, uh, literally, of recruits willing to fight. So no simple solutions here. Um, and I think it's very, very complicated um, to think that uh, a force or military or even engagement can uh, all solve the problem. I think there's multiple level of engagement uh, and we have to think very hard. So there is, uh, madrasas are quite influential in, in Pakistan, in Fatah area especially, um, but there are uh, those perceptions that somehow United States or West especially is um, after them, after Islam, uh, or, or their identity, uh, exasperate the, the issue of engagement uh, with madrasas. Um, and then the uh, Pakistani government, being ally of the United States, then serves the similar role uh, in building trust with madrasas, saying the Pakistani government is, uh, is also out there to, to destroy who we are. And then on top of that, then policymakers in Pakistan as well, and the government, um, uh, when the reports come to the United States, has um, all to do with developing the country, uh, which is the government's job, but very little to do with developing the religious part of it. And Madrasa and religious leaders feel that they are being um, uh, sidelined and isolated. So the, all these perceptions kind of create so this <coughs> uh, sense of victim uh, mentality, sense of mentality that they are, they are being oppressed from all these different sides. And of course, that creates much more isolation and they insulate themselves even further. So uh, level of exposure is very, um, very little and conspiracy theories um, go sky high in madrasa. You hear things, uh, I've been training madrasas, uh, madrasa uh, leaders and teachers for the last five years. About 2,500 have been, uh, been trained our, our program and so many of them are asking us to do more of their training on on, on pedagogy, teacher development, and peace and tolerance, um, which is surprising to most of the, uh, the, the Western folks because uh, uh, the, it's perceived that they are so resistant to, to change. 
or, or to teach contemporary courses, especially English, math, and sciences. Um, but when you uh, engage them with um, a sense of respect, um, you kind of create an equilibrium with integrity. There is there is a way to 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 address the, some of these conflicts, and I, I and I think. One of the major issues with religious leaders in Pakistan, especially with Russians, is that they constantly talk about um, a very autocratic government. Um, it's oppressive um, and it's unjust, and that um, it uh, oppresses its people. It does not provide the development opportunities. The poverty is going up. So these are the major pieces which all of us probably would agree with, right? And this is the religious line. So I think uh, not using madrasas or religious leaders for development activities when they are embedded within uh, the community becomes even more, it looks like a total conspiracy theory because uh, all of our development aid goes to Pakistan and Pakistan says don't give it to, to Madrasa, they, the heightened sense of fear even goes up even more. I do think that there, there's got to be a, a way to find, uh, because um, in Fatah area where the development is acutely needed, Madrasas already have an infrastructure poor but there is an infrastructure. Each madrasa has some sort of a clinic. You can offer a, a lot uh, uh, to the communities there. Uh, and since they talk about justice and injustices, there could be courses. And I've talked to Fatah madrasas many times where they would take a course on justice, how to create, uh, um, even on, on a secular uh, uh, a sense, how to create a small uh, kind of a clinics uh, to provide people their rights, legal rights. Uh, and I think so these are all very healthy activities that one can involve religious leaders and uh, madrasas especially because those are, th those will only enhance the capacity of the government to provide the services to th the community in Fatah which is so needed. Um, there's lots of recommendations here and I'll go through it very, very quickly. Do I have to? You can go through the recommendations. Okay. Um, but uh, I think my, uh, my line of argument is very similar to uh, Shuja's, which is uh, thoughtful, careful engagement of religious leaders and religious institutions by Western, or, uh, Western organizations uh, in a safe way, and also uh, Pakistani government especially, uh, I think would result in a positive social change. Thank you, Azi. And uh, Azi's uh, detailed suggestions are in the report, and I'll be mentioning some of them. Just two points before I get to our uh, major recommendations. One, uh, that uh, there's, there's some kind of a notion, a quaint notion, that the tribal areas and therefore Fatah are different, and that the people are different and their needs are different. Uh, when you actually sit down and talk with them, you discover that they are no different from people in the United States or in the rest of Pakistan, or in Iraq, or in Afghanistan. The basic needs that they talk about, uh, and this emerged in a conversation I had with 23 uh, tribal maliks representing the Wazir and the Dawar tribes in North Waziristan, uh, are irrigation. They want help with their systems. They want basic education so their kids can go and compete in the world outside. They, they want uh, primary health care. Uh, and they want access to hospitals in the area so that they don't have to cart their sick uh, long distances into the settled area where they uh, can, will only do when the people are on their deathbed. And so there's a very bad association between going to a hospital because you never recover, you die. Uh, and, and education, the, uh, which is critical for them. Um, they, they feel that they want their girls educated and they want full-time teachers rather than ghost teachers uh, in the area. So that's something to keep in mind. The other point worth mentioning is um, we mentioned the uh, inability of the Pakistan Army to uh, fight uh, a counterinsurgency. This has been a very difficult transition for an army that was poised always to deal with India in a conventional war, uh, for an army that um, introduced mountain warfare and a school in, in Rattu at 16,000 feet, but only because that could be used in Kashmir. Uh, but that over time, in fact, stopped teaching a separate course called Frontier Warfare, which the British introduced, uh, which was all based on Waziristan and that area. And so 
they're now gradually coming back to that and there's a kind of relearning of the process but the doctrinal shifts haven't taken place in the army it's still an army that lacks the the tools to do the job uh, they don't have helicopters and you need mobility and the United States uh, promised them 27 helicopters and not all have been delivered they're still being refurbished and when you look at that vast area an arc going from uh, the, the south, south Waziristan all the way up to Deer uh, and Bajor uh, it's, how can you deal with a very mobile uh, militant force uh, which is using uh, pickup trucks to move in and out and attack isolated posts and disappear so th there is a serious issue there that needs to be addressed uh, against this background we came up with the proposals uh, of what can be done um, and I'm not going to go through the entire list but I just want to highlight a few so for the government of Pakistan uh, we've suggested that it must openly discuss and agree in Parliament on the status of Fatah this is something that has been pushed under the carpet uh, it needs to discuss its relationship with the NWFP government um, and it needs to discuss the relationship between Fatah and NWFP and the central government um, you have to involve the local people uh, in this situation so that you don't have a dual border situation where you have one border with Afghanistan and another border with Fatah so if you integrate Fatah into Pakistan proper uh, you're likely to get the same kind of uh, reaction and participation from the people of Fatah that you got from the NWFP when it joined Pakistan in 1947 mm -hmm. so an end to treatment of Fatah as a buffer zone that's the the basic point uh, amend or, or then uh, displace and replace the frontier crimes regulation so that you can provide justice which is the point that Azi was making everybody wants justice and they want it rapidly and the Taliban provide rapid justice uh, so how do you displace them you have to replace the FCR also extend the political parties act to Fatah so that they feel that they belong to Pakistan and they participate in the politics of Pakistan um, for the Pakistan military we have suggested uh, strengthening the ability and the role of the frontier corps to provide security to the local population from but from within the population to put an end to the idea of, of sitting in camps uh, and you find this tremendous disparity you go there and there's load shedding so there's no electricity uh, but the military camp is all lit up because they have generators and the rest of the population doesn't have electricity it, it creates tensions and conflict between the military and the locals uh, we've suggested something very specific which is that because of the uh, hiring of uh, people from Fatah and from the Northwest Frontier Province over the years into the military you have a pool of retired FC and Pakistan Army people living in Fatah and if you were to only rehire them and make them part of the development effort and security efforts locally uh, it would be a much less expensive way than having to to use large bodies of trained uh, armor and artillery and so on uh, and they would be people living within the community so they would be much more effective um, we've also suggested an intensification of training and counterinsurgency and I was very pleased in August when I went I got a detailed briefing from General Pasha who is now the head of the ISI who was then head of military operations about an actual program that the Pakistan army now has for inducting troops into uh, this fight uh, so that they go through an indoctrination and training ending up with a live fire uh, exercise so that they know exactly what to expect uh, this is what the British used to do uh, and that's stopped happening over time um, uh, we've also suggested establishing closer cooperation with uh, the Afghan forces and the coalition forces across the Durand line and we're pleased to report that uh, the latest news indicates that the defunct uh, tripartite commission has now actually been revived and is meeting regularly uh, alternating between Kabul and, and uh, Rawal Pindi uh, and General Kiani himself has, has made that uh, a special effort on his part uh, we've also suggested that the United States help train the Pakistan Army 
uh, in producing civil affairs officers because there is no such training or ability uh, within the Pakistan Army today. Uh, they have a few people who deal with PR, but uh, I ran into one colonel uh, who had been two years in Fatah, and I asked him um, in Pashto. I said, do you speak Pashto? And he said, no. Well, that was basically the end of my Pashto, but he didn't even have that. So uh, it, you need to have that capacity and be able to converse. For the U.S. government, for the near term, we are suggesting a definition of an exit strategy for Afghanistan. What is it that will mean victory for whatever aims you want to set for Afghanistan? And to accelerate a very targeted economic development of Pakistan as a whole, because you need to win all of Pakistan's support, uh, the NWFP and, of course, FATA. The NWFP is critical because the stain of militancy has now crept across the border uh, with FATA into the settled areas, and that's now threatening the heart heartland. We've also suggested that the CENTCOM commander somehow convince his lawyers in Washington to uh, redefine the theater of war so that uh, FATA becomes part of that theater, which would allow the CENTCOM to use the commander's emergency relief funds in conjunction with the Pakistan Army, which appears to be willing to use these and get the cash directly into the hands of the people. Uh, we have to recall that this is a cash economy, that the projects that we now come up with in Washington um, start leaking at a very rapid rate uh, in Washington, then in Islamabad, and then in Peshawar. By the time you get to the, the ground, uh, there's very little money getting into the hands of the people. So this way, you're in there, you make the people responsible, give them the money, go back, review what they've done, and then give them some more money. That's the fastest way of getting them on your side, in our view. We also suggest rebuilding the trust because of this enormous trust deficit between the U.S. military and Pakistan. And that can only happen by uh, bringing uh, particularly younger and medium level uh, officers together, Afghan and, Afghan and Pakistan and the U.S. Uh, there was an attempt made to bring colonels from the Pakistan Army to the NDU to interact with the Afghans uh, in Washington. The first attempt failed miserably because for some reason one of the seven agencies uh, that clears visas refused to give a visa to any of the Pakistani colonels, and so they couldn't come. Now, there may be third country options available too, uh, but this needs to be done at a very rapid click. And then for the government of Afghanistan, uh, we are suggesting uh, coordinating with Pakistan and building infrastructure uh, inside uh, Afghanistan and in Fatah so that uh, you have roads, and that roads lead to open economies and create their own job opportunities for people. Uh, we're also suggesting providing cash crop alternatives to opium. And there are proposals afoot from people that know more about it than we do about uh, uh, buying opium even for medicinal purposes uh, for pharmaceutical industry. Um, and we are suggesting, uh, as I mentioned earlier, joint training programs uh, between Pakistan and Afghan forces, and one uh, idea that emerged was that uh, the U.S. is trying to rebuild the Afghan Air Force, and the Pakistan Air Force has had a long experience in building air forces of other smaller countries in the region, particularly in the Gulf, so that may be a good opportunity uh, to, to get into that. Um, briefly on the, uh, the, uh, the madrasas, um, it's, it's not just a short-term but a medium-term effort, as, as, as uh, Azi was saying. Uh, you need to set up and register uh, training centers uh, inside FATA so that they operate uh, under civilian control. Uh, that's quite critical. Um, you need to regulate the madrasas so that they're accredited and they're affiliated with the regular education boards in the rest of Pakistan. And you also need to introduce vocational training in the public schools uh, because uh, work opportunities in the Gulf are drying up. You now have about 4 million Pakhtuns living in Karachi, sizable population, in fact, more than live in Fatah. Uh, and the ability of Karachi to absorb more emigrants from Fatah is very limited. So you need to focus on 
preparing them using whatever is on the ground, including the madrasas, transforming the madrasas into a force for the good rather than one that you view with suspicion. I'm going to stop here, and I'm sorry I took so long. Um, we'll have time for questions, and hopefully uh, Ozzy and I and Arno will be able to answer your questions. Thank you very much. I saw a lady with her hand up. Yes, ma'am. I think the microphone is right next to you, yes. Could you I identify yourself? Here. Yes, my name is Narjus Sali, and I was born and grew up in Pakistan. So I have an observation. The word madrasa is, comes from the word daras, which means lesson, and madrasa really means school. That's a literal translation. And I think the implied meaning of madrasa being a religious school is sort of destroying um, that whole culture in Pakistan. And I feel that madrasa was, was a word that we always used as a translation for school. So why cannot the public school system be integrated once you have your training and everything set up in the madrasas that exist today, which I want to call dini madrasas and not just madrasa? So why would we not call all public schools that are probably Urdu medium uh, madrasas? And they would have all kinds of education, not just religious ed education. Um, I, I, yeah, I think you're right. Madrasa in Arabic, madrasa means school, so, so it's, it, it does not automatically mean it's a religious school. So, dini madrasa means religious, uh, religious school. So, um, but uh, to name public school um, as well, madrasa uh, just probably would not fly, just because the society has grown um, out of it. The name nomenclature and the name itself has so much um, significant symbolic meanings behind it that. Uh, um, many people would have problem going to madrasa that in fact is a public school, uh, which is uh, um, public schools are run by government. Madrasas do not take any money from the government. So I, I think, uh, I'm not sure how, would, how one would do that. But yeah. sure, surely there's also the problem of the fact that uh, the government cannot afford public schools as most of the uh, money goes into the military, hence the uh, growth of the madrasas, which are free. Uh, absolutely. I think this is a huge problem. Yes, sir. Uh, microphone right behind you. Oh, thank you. Uh, this, is, this is a terrific effort using uh, social sciences, sociopolitical and economic approaches to understanding this. Uh, although it wasn't covered in the report, to what degree is the acquisition and distribution and uh, sources of weapons, guns, bombs, and, and so forth, a, a factor in this? And, and I realize that's a different form of information than what we've been covering, but how much of a factor might that be? Surely everybody in that part of the world is born with a gun in its, cra in its cradle. Uh, uh, so. uh, th that's correct, and, and also, um, as many of us have now seen, because almost all foreign journalists uh, make the obligatory stop in Dara Adam Khail, where uh, they can reproduce any weapon in the world. Uh, it may not be as effective, but it certainly looks like any weapon in the world. So, uh, yes, weapons are a part of Fatah, and uh, this is also one of those uh, rules uh, where, because Fatah is treated as a buffer zone, uh, they are allowed to carry their weapons uh, without any let or hindrance, whereas in the rest of Pakistan, you need a license. Uh, now, in terms of the supply of weapons, I guess that was uh, where you were headed. Um, that, uh, unfortunately, uh, w was not a topic that we covered. Uh, and and uh, when I went to Swat and Malakand um, and saw some of the captured weapons as well as the chemicals, it was quite evident that they were coming from all over the world. I mean, the chemicals that were being used to create bombs, for instance, had uh, factory markings from Germany. And so there is clearly an international market which is very effective. And because the borders are porous and because you can get them through the Gulf and uh, through uh, other locations, um, the, uh, the supply uh, of weapons is, is something that has been unabated. Uh, another uh, point that is worth remembering is that there were a lot of weapons left over after the, the uh, Soviet war. 
there were weapons that were um, left in caves that the Taliban were directed to by the ISI uh, when they began their move. And so a lot of those weapons are still in existence and in circulation. Some are pretty ancient, but they still work. And uh, landmines are in plentiful uh, supply, and it doesn't cost a lot for the Taliban to get young kids to go and dig up these mines and then use them for IEDs and other devices. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Walter Anderson. I'm from SICE. I'm Josh Weiss's dissertation advisor. Can you uh, speak up? Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm Josh Weiss's, uh, White's dissertation advisor. Uh, my question is actually directed to Shuja. In your report, you mentioned that the collapse of the Moloch traditional authority has opened up the space for resistance, and much of the resistance is non-Mullah oriented, but yet they've identified themselves with religious Talib symbolism. Is, uh, why has this happened, and can you turn it around, or is it you know, a thing we should strive for to turn this effort of uh, identifying yourself with a kind of religious symbolism, turn it around to something else, Pashtu nationalism, something. Um, actually, uh, Walter, and, and uh, for those who didn't hear him, uh, Walter is the dissertation advisor to uh, Josh White, um, our brilliant scholar and, and partner in this effort. Um, it's it's multi-layered. Uh, it's not just a simple question of you know religion versus uh, some secular approach. Um, the tariq -e taliban of Pakistan uses religion, uh, but the tariq -e taliban also has franchise arrangements with many different groups throughout Fatah, and they vary from uh, agency to agency, and some of these groups are just pure criminals, as we identify them in uh, our report, uh, and they're just using the name of religion uh, as a way of uh, aligning themselves with this broad uh, movement that transcends tribal boundaries. So yes, there is a political significance to it. Uh, they want uh, self-governance, uh, they want rapid justice, and uh, they want to be able to uh, to call the shots themselves. And uh, the tariq -e taliban is appealing to all of that, and where it can, it'll use religion um, to, to help it. And as Azi uh, mentioned, and in the report we mentioned a quote from Baitullah Masood, the, the founder of the Tariq -e Taliban, that uh, uh, it was the predator strikes that really helped him recruit people. Yes, sir. Could you identify yourself? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Paolo von Shirak, Shirak Report. I, I was actually very interested in the comments that you had made before about back on the subject of the madrasas. There is a, this sort of simplified caricaturesque view portrayed also you know, by commentary and media in the West, that these are sort of the factories of radicalism, and there's really, you know, this conveyor belt that uh, spews of you know, other fanatics, suicide bombers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and there's basically nothing we can do about it, short of spraying them with DDT and killing everybody. Uh, what you, the, the picture that you are portraying is very different, is much and much more nuanced in terms of the ability and the opportunity to engage uh, the management, so to speak, uh, or uh, the faculty of these schools. I'm surprised that, that if this is indeed so, and your efforts are underway, that this is not something that is not more you know, earnestly pursued, as this may be the way to defuse the bomb of uh, further recruitment, in other words, which is the, the weapon of, uh, of Islamic radicalism or any other type of radicalism to find new people. To the extent that your efforts seem to be reasonably successful, why is it that this is not more publicized and that not more is done in, in terms of engaging the faculty in the direction of the Thank you. Could you hand the mic to the person behind you? Um, I, yeah, I think this, uh, I think we are successful in that, that we uh, get the engagement, we get a lot of requests uh, to from madrasas to say, we, we like your training, we'd like you to come and uh, give us a kind of a road map as how to reform our old madrasas. So those, those are very, very, uh, very good things. And not all madrasas are obviously not radical. There are some very excellent madrasas there. Um, and, and I think many people do notice um, our effort. We avoid media uh, like anything, obviously, because, um, but of course, you know, it, 
it could say a very good thing about us and it can also say a few things about madrasa and then madrasa won't talk to me because uh, something derogatory has been said by them. So that is a difficult time, a difficult thing in, in getting the exposure um, that we need in a, safe, uh, in a safe way as well. So I think those are some technical difficulties, but I, I do think as a, uh, my boss call it asymmetrical war, I don't like that word, but anyway, but that is probably is the most effective way to, to um, fight radicalization, if you, if you will, in, in, especially in those areas, in border areas. If you look at the border area from all the way from Fatah, all the way to Kashin and, and Jaman, uh, Balochistan, all of those front, uh, provinces next to it uh, in Afghanistan are on fire. I mean, that, that's where most of the most of the fight is going on. So there's a lot of correlation between uh, those those two areas, madrasas and all of that. So I, yeah, I think well, people should take it more seriously. I think we also tend to forget that from 60 to 100,000 young boys come out of these madrasas every year. And I would guarantee that 99% of them believe that America is the enemy and that we're out to destroy Islam and that 9-11 was a Mossad CIA plot. So that's moving, as I think you said before, Azi, moving a huge boulder up the hill. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, Mr. Nawaz, you've uh, talked about improving the trust between Pakistani army and US army. Uh, my question is about the trust between Mr. 10% and Pakistani army. He comes here and calls Kashmiri terrorist. He tells Bush that that world is a better place because of Bush that most even American would laugh at his statement. So how can we take care of this problem unless we address these kind of very fundamental issue of having corrupt people ruling that country? I mean, probably he is in the uh, uh, making of few billion dollars and then leaving Pakistan. Uh, I, is, can we address these problems really without solving this uh, corruption problem in, in that country? Thanks. Um, this is beyond the scope of the paper, but I will give you an answer. <coughs> Uh, I will give you an answer because you deserve an answer and the people of Pakistan deserve an answer. I think the, uh, the solution really is uh, an, an ability of uh, engaging the people of Pakistan in whatever decisions are made. Uh, so uh, when you have decisions, uh, particularly policy decisions that are made uh, behind closed doors, uh, whether it, it involves an alliance with the United States after 9-11 by General Parvez Musharraf or whether it involves any relationship between the current government and the U.S. government. Uh, if it is not discussed openly, um, then you lose the trust of the people. And so the most important thing for Pakistan and for its polity, and particularly for the new civilian government, is to build that trust of the people of Pakistan that the government is there to serve them and not the other way around. And once you do that, uh, you will have the possibility of uh, a longevity of civilian rule. And uh, you may be able to build on the public statement of the current army chief that he wants to keep the army out of politics. But, you know, we've, I wrote a whole book on this topic. We've heard that tune before, and that tune can change very rapidly if the situation deteriorates. So the effort must be on the part of the friends of Pakistan, as well as the people within Pakistan, to try and have an, as open a discussion of these issues. I talk about Fatah, talk about India, talk about Kashmir, uh, and talk about the relationship with the US so that there are no secret agreements and there's no wink or a nod. Yes, sir. Uh, John Keaton. Earlier today, I skimmed all four or 500 pages of the Perot book, the Papan, 5,000 years of history, looking for a few pregnant sentences that we all should have learned before we went in there. But he has a chapter called Patan, Push to Renaissance. And we, of course, are dealing with the security issues, the development issues. But is not there evidence that at the same time these difficulties are overtaking us, that there is a cultural renaissance going on among the Pushtun people that will become a factor as we look into the future, the poetry, the music, the culture, their identification. Are those factors developing positively for the Pushtuns? Well, Caro's book was, was written uh, a few decades ago. Um, and uh, at that time, um, uh, 
because it was so soon after independence, uh, there wasn't any threat uh, emerging from Fatah. Um, but uh, he's right, and you're right, and, and when you go to Pakistan today, and I'm not just talking of Fatah alone, uh, in the Northwest Frontier Province as well as in the rest of Pakistan, uh, there are lots of things that happen in spite of government. Uh, it is probably one of the most active music and art scene uh, in that part of the world. Um, there was an, a very fascinating uh, review article by William Dalrymple uh, recently on fiction uh, emerging out of Pakistan. Uh, it, I think he, the title was Fiction from a Jihadi State. Um, and uh, his uh, conclusion was that there's probably much better fiction coming out of Pakistan today than out of India, which has much larger numbers of writers in English in particular. So yes, uh, this is happening largely because of technology and because the world is, is uh, now available to even uh, the, the poorest man with a transistor radio in Fata. Uh, and those are the mechanisms that we have to use to, to bring those people back on board and to empower them with knowledge and information. Uh, so yes, the Renaissance is there. Uh, it's in all the, the arts and cultures. Uh, but if we lose the security battle uh, and don't provide for economic and social development in Fatah, then the Taliban will come in and switch off the, v uh, the DVDs and the VCRs and the radios and the televisions and then you'll be back to that, the dark ages. Uh, David, we have some in the front row here, our guests from the British House of Commons. Thank you very much, it's a, a pleasure to be here and delighted to hear your thoughts. Uh, looking at the recommendations, I noticed that it's very much US-centric and to do with Pakistan, of course. Um, you mentioned the Darren line, which just gives a hint of uh, the British Foreign Secretary who was responsible for creating that line and indeed the legacy that uh, the British have had an in involvement in Pakistan. Is there anything, is it now too late for the British themselves which have a long history of involvement with the area to use that, their influence or is this very much now a, a US issue? Uh, well, you're right, um, Tobias. The, the, the British did bequeath a legacy drawing lines on both sides of Pakistan that uh, reverberate in history. So uh, the, the lines on the, the border with India and Kashmir and then also the Durand line, which is drawn much, much earlier. Um, uh, of course, Britain has a, an important role as part of the, the Western community. Uh, and also because uh, uh, the British Army, uh, <coughs> if Britain were to commit more of its meager forces to uh, the area would probably help uh, the U.S. effort inside Afghanistan um, uh, because they have uh, not just a tradition but be uh, great knowledge of how to interact with, uh, with the locals as was proven in uh, the Basra area in Iraq by, by actually being in the population. Uh, but I think in the end um, uh, it's money that talks and in the United States uh, has the largest pot of money available and you really, if you're going to change things dramatically, you have to make that uh, economic impact very quickly so that people can see uh, what the counterfactual to the current situation is. That if, the, if you can give them the cash, empower them to use that cash for their own good. Um, so to the extent that Britain can join that effort, uh, it certainly has the knowledge and I would certainly support that. Yes, sir, at the back. P Peter Coharis, sir lawyer and in a former life a relief and development worker in Asia and Africa, I, I very much find compelling your analysis about the socioeconomic development and empowering local people and really looking to them for what initiatives to, to be taken. But I've read a lot about uh, the insecurity in the region and, and the traditional government structures, whether it was the Maliks or, or others, even the army being embarrassed and, and uh, the traditional social structures, tribal structures being attacked and undermined specifically because they were a threat to the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda, much the way Al-Qaeda targeted uh, tribal leadership in the south of Iraq versus in Anbar where they weren't, they didn't do that and the British had a difficult time of it in the south. I wonder to what extent do you, f what, what, what can we do about that 
the lack of security, the, the targeting of people who appear to be working with the government, to be working against the, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, um, because it, it, it's awfully difficult, as you know, to develop and, and start some of the programs you advocate if the security situation won't permit it. And let's face it, the, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda aren't foolish. They understand that, that it's a threat to them. I think I mentioned one uh, specific recommendation that we had, which was to change the approach to providing security so that it's community-based uh, by, by putting uh, the retired uh, FC and Pakistan Army veterans uh, from Fatah and making them responsible for security uh, within their communities as well as security of development workers uh, who are doing rebuilding and reconstruction work. Um, but uh, there's another aspect to it which has uh, been highlighted by the recent operation in Bajor where the local tribes uh, themselves uh, took on the job of policing as an adjunct to the uh, Frontier Corps. Uh, the, the only danger in that is that because of intertribal rivalries, when you end up arming uh, one group uh, with more sophisticated weapons than the other, then you risk the problem of, uh, 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 of an imbalance in that military power once you exit. And, and then if that particular tribe decides to turn against you, you'll have a much more implacable foe. So um, you really have to begin at the community level and have a presence that is seen uh, by the locals uh, so that they can then uh, trust the security forces to protect them and not leave them at the mercy of the Taliban because the forces come on a patrol and then go back to their fortress. Um, and then the Taliban come in and basically uh, using threats and coercion, um, uh, cower the people down. Uh, we have time for three more. There's a gentleman right here, the lady at the back, and you, sir, in the front. Uh, thank you, sir. Hello. Uh, I think, uh, Mr. Nawaz, you underestimate or underemphasize the role of the central government or central authority in the tribes in the Fata region. In fact, the system of paying Maliks was started by Shah Jahan so that he could withdraw the forces and concentrate the monies on building Taj Mahal and the city of Shah Jahanabad. So the system goes back for 340 years. And uh, in 1948, there were six brigades, six Pakistan army brigades in the Fatah region, all of whom were withdrawn with the support of the tribals to wage war in Kashmir. So there is a much more tighter relationship. Uh, I'd like your comments on that. Thank you. Yes, um, uh, the, the brigades that you refer to were withdrawn under um, other interestingly named Operation Curzon, um, which goes back to an earlier historical reference uh, of, of the British aims uh, in Central Asia. Um, there, there were two reasons. Uh, one, of course, was uh, to, show to show the people of Fatah that uh, Pakistan was not a colonial uh, force. And therefore, um, instead of having the, the garrisons in Wana and other places, that uh, there would only be the locals, uh, the Frontier Corps, the levies, the, uh, uh, all the local, locally recruited people providing security. Uh, the other one, um, I think you, you over... Uh, estimate uh, the numbers of people that came from all the Fatah region um, into the Kashmir war. There was a total number of about 5,000 odd uh, tribal Lashkar um, that went into Kashmir that came from all over the Northwest Frontier province as well as Fatah. So it wasn't Fatah centric. Uh, yes, the central government has a role, um, but uh, I believe, and a lot of people in Pakistan believe that the relationship between the center and the periphery in Pakistan uh, needs to be readjusted uh, because the, the government of Pakistan cannot control everything from the center. And the only way of bringing Balochistan and the Northwest Frontier Province and Fatah and Sin uh, to, to feel that they are part of the federation is by giving them much more authority to, to manage their own affairs. Lady at the back. Bridget Keston, U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. You mentioned the Kurram Agency and the ongoing Shia-Sunni conflict in your remarks, and I didn't see that issue addressed specifically in any of the recommendations. 
So what recommendations do you have for the Pakistani government with respect to that ongoing conflict as well as the um, populations of internally displaced people who are from current agency? Well, um, my recommendation would be first of all to appeal to Pakistan's friends in Iran and the Arabian Peninsula to stop at source any financing of those activities. Secondly, uh, and this is an internal matter for Pakistan, uh, to effectively seal uh, the entry into Fatah so that the, the Punjabi militants that are fueling that, uh, that fight and that are training uh, the Taliban and, and other militants in advanced warfare against the Pakistani state uh, can be controlled. And of course, the most important one coming after the Mumbai attacks is uh, to somehow de-weaponize uh, those Punjabi militant groups in central and southern Punjab. Uh, because till you do that, uh, you will always have this risk. Uh, you have to remember that in 2008, there were over 60 suicide bombings in Pakistan. Um, and in, in 2007, there were about 60, 57 to 60, depending on, on how you count them. And in 2007, uh, something like 36 of them were against the, the military. And so these are the people that have trained the terrorists to use suicide bombing against the Pakistani state. So you have to control them internally. That was a much broader issue. So you know, we, we were trying to get the report uh, as briefly as possible, but you can see that it wasn't as brief as we wanted it to be. Yes, sir. Hi, Shuja. Uh, my question is sort of uh, just general. Uh, it seems to me I would have liked to see an integrated recommendation of the Pakistan government and the military. It seems to me that uh, that is central to the progress in the future. Uh, the second thing is I feel the role of India is very important. And while you mentioned the difficulties, I think it, it should not be not included in such a report. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, again, this was one of those broader issues that we only referred to uh, in, in uh, some of our discussion. Uh, when you see the r report in detail, you'll see that uh, the conflict with India or the threat of conflict with India still informs the Pakistan army and still informs a lot of the political discussion within the country. Uh, and so that really remains uh, the key element, that once that conflict is removed from the scene, uh, you have all kinds of things opening up, including the point that Arno made, which is uh, instead of 16 cents to the dollar available for uh, development, uh, you may have 40 or 50 cents to the dollar available for development instead of uh, currently where you have uh, reportedly something like 40 cents going to uh, the, the armed forces and the rest primarily going to debt uh, servicing. So uh, the India-Pakistan solution uh, would open up all these possibilities. And, and for that, uh, not just the Indian and Pakistani government, but the people of India and Pakistan need to push their governments in that direction. And surely the final settlement in Afghanistan, if one comes, will obviously have to be part, India will have to be part of the solution. Uh, that brings us to the end of this uh, afternoon session on uh, federally administered tribal areas in Pakistan, and I think we owe a big debt of gratitude to our two experts. <laughs>